interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Law. Welcome to the Reason and Theology show, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Wednesday evening. Wow, it's been an interesting day between our first show and, and this second show now. All kinds of uh, interesting reactions. Uh, I've, I've been able to come across all kinds of very interesting reactions ever since uh, this morning, especially in reference to uh, some of the videos we've been doing recently. So uh, you know you're doing right when you see all of these uh, wild accusations and reactions coming out from some people. You know you're touching on the right topics. And speaking of which, we will be touching on another topic that is going to have people uh, probably up in arms. And that is the Second Vatican Council, <laughs> as we've talked about on the show several times now. And we're going to continue to do so. But this time I'm going to be joined by Father Deacon Anthony Drangani, who has been on the show before. He has been extremely helpful, very level-headed. I've really appreciated the contribution that he's given to the show so far. So I really look forward to hearing his thoughts as an Eastern Catholic deacon on the Second Vatican Council, which is what we're going to be discussing. Coming up next, Father Deacon Anthony. Father Deacon, how are you? It's great to have you back on the show. It's great to be here, Michael. I always enjoy being here with you. I really enjoy your inter interaction. I, I want to say this might be your third or fourth time on the show, so, something like that. I think it's the fourth time. For, fourth time, yeah. Every time you've been on, it's it's been very, very helpful and enlightening. So I really look forward to this. Um, and this is a topic you don't hear much about. Now, we, we hear a whole lot mm -hmm. of talk about the Second Vatican Council. But you don't hear a whole lot when it comes to Vatican II from an Eastern perspective, let alone an Eastern Catholic perspective. So I, I really want to hear what exactly are your thoughts? You know, as, as you know, we, we haven't really talked about this, but backstage or anything, I don't really know your position on it as, as far as where you land on it. I, I can speculate. I probably have a, a decent idea of, of where you're at on it, but I, I don't know for sure. And so I look forward to hearing more. Uh, so, so tell us about it. Where do you land sure. when it comes to the Second Vatican Council? Well, I'll begin with a little story here. Yeah. So I grew up in the late 70s, 80s, and I went to a Catholic elementary school. And that was a period of uh, considerable confusion, I would say, within Catholicism. It was, it was before the Catechism of the Catholic Church had come out, and a lot of people really uh, weren't sure what Catholicism actually taught and believed. It wasn't clear to some individuals. So I went to an elementary school that was Catholic, and it was during a period in which things were, you know, a, a little rocky with liturgical life within Catholicism, to put it mildly. So I remember going to the school and um, would have masses in the school. The music would always be like really cheesy 70s folk music. And they do things like you have us walk around with felt banners. Uh, people would bring up little offerings of plants. <sighs> Strange things happened. And I, I remember thinking, man, I, I just cringe when I see this. And I was like <laughs> 10 years old and I was cringing, right? 
And whenever <laughs> I ask why we do these things, they'd always say, because Vatican II. Vatican II right. told us to do this. Oh, okay. So <laughs> as a kid, I kept hearing that. And uh, I remember going to one church one time where they were doing a polka mass, you know, and all this polka music, and people were kind of moving around in their pews during a mass and thinking, man, this is just so cheesy, so cheesy. And again, Vatican II. Um, so growing up, I associated Vatican II with really, really bad music and tacky banners. It wasn't something I thought very highly of. And that really changed when I went to graduate school. I went to uh, Franciscan University of Steubenville for a master's in theology uh, back in the late 90s. And while I was there, I had a really awesome professor, uh, Dr. Alan Schreck. He was incredible. And one of the courses we had to take with him was called The Documents of Vatican II. And the whole point of the course was to read and understand Vatican II's documents. And as I read through them and studied them with him, it dawned on me that Vatican II was awesome. The actual documents, I'm convinced, are the work of the Holy Spirit. There's a beautiful vision in there. But somehow that vision and the documents and what was being attributed to Vatican II uh, really parted ways. So uh, all the crazy stuff I was told growing up came from Vatican II had nothing to do with Vatican II. It had everything to do with people misinterpreting it and appropriating it for their own agendas. At the same time, I had another course at Francisco University with a liturgy professor, Father Giles Dimmick, great professor as well. And he had to study the liturgical documents that came out of Vatican II and the liturgical reforms. And again, I was amazed. Uh, the actual liturgical documents that the council produced and the liturgical reforms and what, what led up to the liturgical reforms were wildly different than the uh, polka masses and the cheesy guitar music and all that stuff that I had associated with the council. Instead, as an Eastern Catholic, I was impressed by how the liturgical vision of the council itself was drawing both from the ancient Roman rite, but also from the Eastern liturgical tradition. Uh, there was a lot of Eastern influence in the envisioned liturgical reforms of Vatican II. And again, I was amazed because what actually took place was so different from what the council envisioned. Um, but also as an Eastern Catholic, I found myself impressed by the ecclesiology of the council. There had been a tendency for a long time to say that the Latin church was the church. Uh, Eastern Catholics were oftentimes treated as, you know, redheaded stepchildren, as others have said. And we weren't really given uh, a clear understanding of where we fit into the church. Mm. Vatican II lays it out that the Catholic church is a communion of churches. And that's really the ecclesiology of the first millennium. And Vatican II really kind of uh, builds that up and explains it. And I think that also makes possible potential groundwork for God willing future reunification with some of the Orthodox churches. So um, as an Eastern Catholic, I'm very keen on it, but I'm especially keen on it too, because Vatican II has a vision for Eastern Catholicism. And that is for us to be fully and authentically Eastern. As you probably know, for a long time, Eastern Catholics suffer from a terrible inferiority complex. In a lot of places, we try to model uh, Latin customs. We try to do things like the Latins did to show that we were truly Catholic. And in the process, we kind of bastardized our own tradition. And if you take a, um, an Eastern Catholic liturgy and you water it down and you add all kinds of Latin elements and take out a lot of Eastern elements, you end up with something that's neither Western nor Eastern, but just kind of blah. And it doesn't really work too well. And Vatican II had a vision for the Eastern Catholic churches to be fully, truly Eastern. And what I did see was Vatican II was implemented in many of the Eastern Catholic churches in a way that was actually true to the council. So um, in many of the Byzantine Catholic churches, such as Milkite, Ukrainian, Ruthenian, uh, Romanian, what I saw was churches that had restored their old liturgical traditions and had recovered their spirituality and their theological tradition as well, and were flourishing because of it. Um, so for Eastern Catholics specifically, Vatican II was a blessing because it, it gave us the, the vision that we should have had all along, but it helped us to reclaim that vision of being Eastern Christians in union with Rome. And that also I think is important as an example 
of what Catholicism is meant to be. Catholicism is meant to be truly universal. It's not meant to be, you know, just limited to one tradition, one place, one peoples. So if the Eastern Catholic churches are fully and authentically Eastern, it shows that the Catholic Church has room for a variety of different liturgical traditions, a variety of different theological expressions, a variety of different spiritualities, all of which are fully Catholic. And I think that provides hope that among the Eastern Orthodox, they can see this, and maybe it can hopefully show them that it is possible to be in communion with Rome without losing what makes you distinctively Eastern. So in summary, Michael, I am very, very pro-Vatican II. I love it. I believe very strongly it was the work of the Holy Spirit, but at the same time, I bemoan how it's been so horribly misinterpreted and how it's been basically, um, how should I put it? I was going to use something vulgar. Uh, I'll say it was basically um, bastardized and misused in a way that completely disrespects what the council was intended to be. And I think it's now happening from both sides, not just the liberals, <clears throat> but also now mm -hmm. some of the conservative traditional Catholics. They're they're doing the same thing. They're taking liberal criticisms of uh, the church and applying it to Vatican II. In fact, I've I've even seen some traditional Catholics use arguments that the liberals use to show discontinuity between the pre and post conciliar church. I've seen some traditional Catholics use those exact same arguments, just like the liberals. Now the liberals are doing it for a different reason. They're doing it to, because they want to stress discontinuity because they don't want to be in continuity with the past. And some of these traditionalists are doing it because they want to stress discontinuity to show that there's something wrong with the post conciliar church and we shouldn't give a cent to sec the second Vatican council. So it's for a different reason, but some of them end up using the same arguments. Do you think, so, I mean, that leads up to this question. Do you think that there's a substantial discontinuity between the Second Vatican Council and the Preconciliar Church? Or do you think that there's substantial continuity, but maybe some reform? Definitely the latter, substantial continuity, but also some reform. Yeah. Um, but if you look at what Vatican II was meant to be in the documents itself, it's definitely in full continuity with the the tradition of the church going back to the apostles. Uh, but sadly, uh, that hasn't filtered down into practice in a lot of places. Do you, um, <clears throat> well, let me ask you this maybe. What are some of the concerns, however, that you might have with the Second Vatican Council? Because I think we all have some criticisms of it. As an Eastern Catholic, what do you think are some of those things that could be, um, you know, Put out there by way of criticism, charitable and respectful criticism, of course. Um, I, I would say that perhaps the documents were a little vague in some points, mm -hmm. and maybe again they're they're not extremely vague, but there are some areas where yeah. there was some vagueness, and I think that was intentional. I think there was some intentional vagueness, so it could be implemented in a way that had some flexibility. Um, but the sad part was that vagueness basically became a license for craziness yeah. and misinterpretation. Yeah. You know, I remember listening to um, an Orca Mandrite, Eastern Catholic, Robert Taft. Oh, yes. And he was, you know, he's he's got a lot of good stuff out there. I've heard some stuff from him that made me think, maybe question a couple of things. <laughs> but uh, on the whole, he, he's got some really, really good stuff out there. I highly recommend him. And mm -hmm. um, I remember his comments on Vatican II. He seemed to... Um, see it as actually a breath of fresh air when it comes to allowing the Eastern Catholic Church to um, not only get back to its own roots liturgically, but also begin to establish Eastern Catholic theology. In fact, that was the very purpose of the lecture that he was giving was to discuss what is Eastern Catholic theology. And his point was that it was very hard to develop an Eastern Catholic theology until the Second Vatican Council. What do you think about that? And and if you if you agree with it, why why? What did Vatican II to do to maybe open that up? Yeah. So it, it really clarified what the Eastern Catholic churches are, which are churches, as opposed to just rites. So 
you know, traditionally the word right refers to a, so I'm hearing some fuzziness. Are you hearing that? Yeah, it's, it's on my end. I apologize okay. for it. Yeah. Okay. So um, the word right refers to uh, primarily a liturgical expression, but also a type of spirituality. And there are some theological you know, overtones in it as well. But the word right has oftentimes been used primarily to apply towards you know, liturgical expression. So what happened was, for a long time, it was spoken of like this. You have one church, the Roman Catholic Church, with different rites that make it up. So Eastern Catholics were often called like, you know, the Bentine rite of the Roman Catholic Church or, or the, um, you know, the Maronite rite of the Roman Catholic Church. But the idea was we were all Roman Catholics with, just with different rites. And if you really look at it that way, it makes sense that people would shy away from any kind of differences in spirituality or theology. But again, that's not the ecclesiology of the first millennium. And Vatican II really clarified it really clarified that the Catholic Church is a communion of churches and that all of us together you know, make up one universal church, but there are multiple churches that make up this church. And it clarified, again, that right refers to one aspect of things, which is primarily liturgy, but also spirituality and theology. But more than that, by declaring that these are churches with their own traditions, with their own approach to doing things, it kind of gave Eastern Catholics a license to be ourselves to be what we're meant to be. So we're no longer just seen as Roman Catholics with a funny mass, but we're actually churches with our own tradition, with our own ecclesiology, uh, with our own theological perspective. And that made a huge difference. And Vatican II, again, is very clear that we should reclaim all of these things. Where we've lost our tradition, we should reclaim it. Where we've lost our theological perspective, we should reclaim it. Uh, be fully, truly Eastern in union with Rome. You know, when you, when you talk here about the issue of the Roman, uh, well, I think the way you put it was um, the this or that right, uh, this or that form of the Roman right. Is that the way you put it? How to, uh, like, no. No, Different this or that right of the Roman church. Roman Catholic church. Yeah. 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 When, when I hear that, though, I could see how it could be seen in the light you mentioned, but I could also see it just referring to these are Eastern churches in communion with Rome, as opposed to Eastern churches that are not in communion with Rome. Right. What do you think the, about that? Yeah, sure. So the, the phrase Roman Catholic, as I'm sure you know, originated originally as an insult against Catholics who follow the Pope. Uh, that's where it began. You were called a Roman Catholic if you followed the Pope and was seen as an insult, but then mm -hmm. Catholics took it on as a badge of pride. Mm -hmm. um, but on the ground level, the term Roman Catholic has become very much associated with the Latin church. Mm -hmm. And specifically, if you look at the actual technical language within church documents, within canon law, I mentioned there are churches and rites. So for example, I'm part of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, which uses the Byzantine rite. Mm -hmm. um, there is a Latin church. There is no Roman, Roman Catholic church in canon law. There's a Latin church but there also is a Roman rite. So the only church that uses the, the Roman rite is the Latin church. So for that reason, uh, Roman Catholics are often associated, or Latin Catholics are often called Roman Catholics because they're the Catholics who use the Roman rite. Just like I'm Byzantine Catholic, I'm a Catholic who follows the Byzantine rite. But on the practical level, on the ground level, um, the terms are used to describe different groups. So for example, in Pittsburgh, there are two different uh, Catholic dioceses. There's one church that calls itself the Roman Catholic Diocese of Pittsburgh. And then there's another church that calls itself the Byzantine Catholic Arch Eparchy of Pittsburgh. You know, and you can tell if one sign, if one church has a sign that says Roman Catholic, that means they're using the Roman Rite, they're part of the Latin Church. Uh, if another church has a sign that says so and so Byzantine Catholic Church, you know it's part of the Byzantine tradition and it uses the Byzantine Rite. So on the practical level, um, Roman Catholic is used to distinguish uh, Latin Catholics from Eastern Catholics, but also I think it's most appropriate to apply to Catholics who use the Roman Rite, which are the Catholics of the Latin Church. Beyond that though, referring to Eastern Catholics as Roman Catholics, um, it basically, it plays right into the hands of the most anti-Catholic Eastern Orthodox fanatics. Mm -hmm. Because they always say, if you come into union with Rome, 
as an Eastern Christian, you lose everything Eastern about yourself. And you're basically a Roman Catholic who's play acting. So when some Latin Catholics insist on calling Eastern Catholics Roman Catholics, all it does is bolster their argument that if you enter in union with Rome, you ultimately lose what it means to be an Eastern Christian. So I think it's best from a practical perspective to use Roman Catholic to refer to those who follow the Latin, the Latin church, who use the Roman rite, and to call the rest of us Eastern Catholics. Uh, number one, because it's just an example for the Orthodox as to how we view our ecclesiology. But number two, it's, it's simply how we differentiate each other on the ground level. But number three, also, I think it's respectful towards Eastern Catholics to not call us Roman Catholics, because we don't identify ourselves as Roman Catholics. We don't think of ourselves as Roman Catholics. And when people insist on calling us Roman Catholics, you're kind of disrespecting us, especially when there's actually nothing that exists in canon law or in liturgical documents or any official church document talking about Roman Catholicism. The only reference you see to Roman anything in official church documents is the Church of Rome, which is the Diocese of Rome, or the Roman Rite, which is the rite followed by the Latin Church. I've seen papal documents where they talk about the Holy Catholic and Ro Roman Apostolic Church. You know, they'll add Roman in there. It's kind of, why, yeah. why did you add that one in there? <laughs> and that's because they're emphasizing, you know, union with Rome, that Rome is yeah. the head see, but, yeah. you know, technically speaking, in, in actual church structure, there is no Roman Catholic Church other than the Church of Rome itself, which is the Diocese of Rome. You know, while we're talking about terms here, not to go too far on a tangent, but I, I got I got a good Eastern Catholic in front of me, so I got to ask two questions for you. Number one, what do you think about the term unit? We hear that a lot used as a derogatory term. Why is it a derogatory term? What do you think about it? Well, I personally don't mind it. I don't mind being called a unit uh, because I know it implies uh, you know, union with Rome, which yeah. I'm all for. What, what's wrong on with the, that? <laughs> on the other hand, it's the way it's been used. Um, yeah. You know, this is an extreme example, but the N-word, right? The word you dare right. not speak. Right. If you say that word, your life is over. I'm not going to say right. it, obviously. Right. But um, that word took on horrible connotations because of the way it was used. I mean, the word itself was just a, a derivative of the word for dark or black, but it was used as a term to really degrade and dehumanize people. So for that reason, it took on a horrible, horrible connotation. Mm -hmm. uh, the term unit was largely used by uh, Eastern Orthodox fanatics to call Eastern Catholics traitors and sellouts. And the narrative yeah. always was that we, we sold our souls for money. You know, if we came into union with Rome, we'd get, get rich and be wealthy. And we basically sold out everything we believed in. So the term basically became synonymous with sellout or traitor or apostate, you know? So for that reason, a lot of Eastern Catholics don't like that term because of the way it was used to degrade us and deride us. Yeah, that, that makes, that makes sense. Although personally, if I, uh, ever am able to, <clears throat> uh, transition to an Eastern Catholic church, I'll definitely bear the, the name you need it proudly because <laughs> as you noted it just means union with rome yes yeah. yes pl please call me that um as opposed to a breaking in communion with rome i mean that now i i know the eastern orthodox don't have a problem with that but i i think that that's a major concern in the first millennium so it brings us back to that issue um mm -hmm. now furthermore one thing that i've heard in criticism of eastern orthodox is you'll see okay, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and there will be a criticism that, oh, this is ethnically or nationally based. This is one of the criticisms that I hear of Eastern Orthodoxy from generally Latin Rite Catholics. But you look at Eastern Catholics and you'll see Ethiopian Catholic Church, Ukrainian Catholic Church, and, and things like that. So couldn't those crit same criticisms be made about the Eastern Catholics? And if so, why is that not a really good criticism in your estimation? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's a good criticism because the term, it doesn't describe an ethnic group. It describes a liturgical and spiritual heritage. So 
again, getting back to the term Roman right, you know, a lot of churches around here call themselves Roman Catholic on their signs. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the church is full of Italian people. Mm -hmm. What it means is that they're following a liturgical and spiritual tradition that came from Jesus through the apostles, through Rome to the rest of the world. Uh, in the same way, I call myself Ukrainian Catholic. I am not Ukrainian. I don't have any Ukrainian blood in me that I'm aware of. I'm actually Italian and French and Belgian and a bunch of other stuff, but yeah. mostly Italian. <laughs> um, but I probably call myself Ukrainian Catholic because the faith that I follow, the tradition I follow, it came from Christ and the apostles to Constantinople, which makes me Byzantine, and then from Constantinople to Kiev in Ukraine, and then it came from Ukraine to here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the term really refers more to your tradition than to an ethnicity. Now, in this country, though, we've often come to associate it with ethnicity, largely because of the unique historical circumstances that led to orthodoxy establishing itself in this country. <clears throat> so in most of the world, you know, the, the, the difference between Greek Orthodox or Ukrainian Orthodox or Russian Orthodox, people aren't that conscious of it because they live in a country where one type of Orthodoxy is the Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Here in the United States, we had all these ethnic groups coming here from different parts of the world. <clears throat> And each one was very keen on preserving their heritage. The other part of it too was orthodoxy came here largely through uh, lay people. Lay people would come, they'd gather together, they'd establish a church, and then they'd petition their bishop from the old country, wherever they're from, to send a priest. So you ended up with uh, you know Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox, you know all these different varieties of Orthodox. And in many cases, those churches were established by immigrants who, number one, wanted to maintain the Orthodox faith, but also were trying to hold on to their ethnic heritage as well. So ethnic heritage and Orthodoxy became very much intertwined in many places, primarily in North America, in the United States, uh, but in the rest of the world, it, it, it isn't the same association. There isn't this connection between Orthodoxy and ethnicity in other parts of the world like there is in the United States. So that's primarily like a an American or a North American problem, not so much in Europe or in other parts of the world. Getting back to Vatican II, <clears throat> what are some of the things in there? Well, before I ask that question, let me ask you another one. Um, in Vatican II, we see somewhat of a different discipline being discussed. And the discipline is to allow for communion for Eastern Orthodox and others of the like. As an Eastern Catholic, what do you think about that? I'm completely for it. And why? So, especially if you believe that these people lack the fullness of the church because they, um, their bishop might be in schism. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no, I'm not saying that every single individual is formally a schismatic or something. But at the very least, there's some material schism there. Right. right. I, I um, would say, what would you say the, there? the majority of, of Orthodox Christians, the majority of Orthodox bishops and clergy, um, their separation from Rome doesn't really rise to the level of schism in the sense that they didn't choose it. And right. Right. many of them are as Catholic as you or I in their actual daily spirituality and their liturgical life and their sacramental life. Um, and the differences that separate us aren't something they think about much. I mean, right. for all practical purposes, they're living no differently than any Catholic is. Um, the fact they're not in communion with Rome is unfortunate and it's a separation, but their spirituality, I mean, they are essentially Catholic in, in almost every way that counts. Now, I have no problem with those people receiving communion in a Catholic church uh, because the schism that exists in many ways is an unf unfortunate accident of history. I mean, the actual the decrees that led to it, you know, the, the split that took place in 1054 was actually abolished. I mean, Pope Paul VI and the Patriarch Athenagoras, they actually assigned those excommunications to oblivion. So technically from that perspective, the schism isn't fully in existence, but there's a difference between those individuals and individuals who choose to embrace schism on their own, mm -hmm. whether it's somebody who was Catholic and leaves to become Orthodox 
or somebody who's been Orthodox their entire life, or a Protestant that became Orthodox, who choose to make separation from Rome a defining part of their identity. And they build their spirituality around that. And you know, and I know, there are a lot of people like that, especially on the internet right now. People for whom being Orthodox primarily means being anti-Roman and anti-Western. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And for those individuals, um, if they make that the central part of their spirituality and their identity, yeah, they they are in schism, and they they should really think twice before receiving communion at a Catholic church. And frankly, they wouldn't anyway. Sure. Uh, those people would never even put foot in a Catholic sure. church, and if they did, right. they would never receive communion. Right. Yeah, that, that was a very good answer, because I think what you're articulating is that the distinction between material schism and formal schism, mm -hmm. whereas the way I see it is what Vatican II is doing is it's allowing for communion in the sharing in sacred things with those who might be in material schism, but not with formal schismatics. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in the case of formal schismatics, Vatican II is, is not, not in favor of that. That's, there's still a prohibition there uh, by divine law. But in the case of material schism, I, I could see it for the reasons why you described and, and for others. So it's a very good answer, but you did say something in there that I want to ask you about. You mm -hmm. said something about, well, the excommunications that led to this had been lifted. That's true. But then the dissent that came from the um, rejection of our teachings after the Council of Florence still remains. Now, moreover, they have now uh, different um, councils that put themselves in opposition to us. They have also had confessions, not confessions, but agreements uh, between the different patriarchs and letters from the patriarchs signed by the patriarchs saying uh, where, where they stand. And those have not been lifted. They have not revoked those things. What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, for the, for the average Orthodox person, those things have zero bearing on their lives and their spirituality. Um, you know, if somebody is really into Orthodox theology and they study those things and they fully embrace them, odds are that person's not going to be going to a Catholic church anyway. Um, I know, for example, at my own parish, we have Orthodox people who come to communion from time to time, some pretty regularly. Um, there's an Orthodox community nearby where sometimes people from there come to our church and they'll worship with us and they'll receive communion. I give them communion and they come up to me and they're no different than us. Their spirituality is the same as us. Their theology is the same as us and they love us and we love them. We're like family. Um, but those aren't the people who are living out schism. These individuals have never even heard of these councils you mentioned. They've never heard of these various decrees from patriarchs. Um, and they're, day-to-day -day life on the ground, they're no different than a Catholic as far as their spiritual life goes. I have no problem with them receiving communion. But if somebody, you know, is an Orthodox apologist of the extreme variety and devotes their life to disproving Catholicism, again, they wouldn't set foot in a Catholic church anyway. Somebody's asking about the concern of indifferentism. What, what about giving the impression of indifferentism? What do you say to them? Mm -hmm. We don't want to give that impression. Um, separation is a reality and it does matter. We can't act like there's no difference between being in communion with Rome or being out of communion with Rome. Uh, there is a difference and it is an important matter. Um, but again, for a person who's born into that situation, who through no fault of their own, uh, you know, is out of communion with Rome, but their spiritual life and their belief system is essentially the same as any Catholic, um, you know, Recognizing that they are so close to us that we can't share communion is very different than indifferentism. Uh, I would say there's a difference between recognizing that somebody is family, even if there's a bit of a strain in the relationship, versus saying it doesn't matter if you're in communion with Rome or not. I Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, th I can't think offhand where I've seen it. But I, I think I've seen official documents of the church that speak about sharing in sacred things with some non-Catholics in certain situations. 
as long as it avoids scandal and indifferentism. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you familiar with that? Have you seen that yes. before? I have during during my dissertation period when I was doing a lot of research, I ran across all kinds of interesting documents about this very topic, and I saw a lot of interesting historical things about it too. Uh, this fascinated me. Uh, I wrote my dissertation on a fellow named Adrian Fortescue. Oh, yeah. He, I'm a huge fan of his, and he was very keen on reunion between the Catholic and the Orthodox. Yeah, he lived in uh, England in the late 1800s, early 1900s during a period in which there was a lot of misunderstanding about Eastern Christianity in the West. Mm -hmm. And he was a Roman Catholic priest, but he wanted to educate people about Eastern Christianity. So he actually um, decided to go to the Middle East to study Eastern Christianity firsthand. Mm -hmm. He taught himself fluent Arabic. He uh, grew a long beard. He got a tan. He went to the Middle East disguised as an Arab. He had some adventures. He got into gunfights. He had to fight off robbers. Um, but he... He actually uh, lived out Eastern Christianity in its cradle in the Middle East. And he came back and wrote a lot about this. And one thing he talked about was how in the Middle East, the, the separation between Catholics and Orthodox that we really focus on in the West um, was a very permeable thing. Uh, the schism that we think of in hard terms wasn't quite as hard in the Middle East. And he looked at the history of this, and what he found, and what I found also in my own research, is if you look at the history, the schism that we talk so much about and think so much about kind of faded in and out over centuries. And in different places, it never really existed, or it didn't exist until later. Um, but there are periods all throughout history where you know Orthodox and Catholics were sharing communion, where Orthodox bishops were giving communion to Catholics, where Catholics were giving communion to Orthodox, where Orthodox and Catholics would actually, you know, share parishes during certain occasions. I mean, it was very, very permeable. The, the schism is this hard divide that so many people on the internet love to celebrate is more of a, an abstract theological concept than it is reality on the ground in a lot of places today even, but especially throughout history. Um, you know, when the, I think one thing that made it worse was the Crusades. You know, I don't want to bash on the Crusades. I understand the reason. You know, Christians in the Middle East were calling out for help, and the West sent help. But unfortunately, some bad apples came along with the help. Mm -hmm. um, so the Crusades, you know, were used as a, a vehicle for people to get wealthy and to abuse people in the process. But one of the unfortunate things that happened with the Crusades was a lot of times when these Crusaders would show up in these different Middle Eastern places, there were Orthodox bishops there who welcomed them as brothers and didn't even see them as being separated. They saw them as being fellow Orthodox Christians. Uh, the separation wasn't even on their mind in many places. Many, many of these bishops didn't even consciously think there was a separation. But then the Crusaders would show up, and in some cases they'd say, hey, you have the wrong faith, we're bringing with us the true faith, and they would try and replace the Orthodox bishop with a Catholic bishop. And that actually made the schism real in those places, where up until that point, it, it was something that was really abstract that nobody even recognized. You know, it kind of reminds me of during the Council of Trent, some Venetian bishops raised some questions on whether or not Session 6 is condemning uh, the practice of economia when it comes to divorce and remarriage. And they were quick to note that, no, it's not. It's actually excluding the Greeks and their practice, so it's not condemning them. But what's interesting is in that whole discussion comes out uh, the fact that some of the bishops over there, uh, not in that territory necessarily, but in the Middle East, as if I recall correctly, uh, some of the Catholic bishops that were Eastern were being ordained in some cases by Eastern Orthodox uh, bishops just due to necessity and vice versa, if I recall correctly. Yes, that, that did happen. Um, that did happen. Yeah, it's just interesting to, to see that kind of stuff historically. You tend to think that, oh, this is something that's just new to Vatican II. There was just no kind of sharing in sacred things prior to Vatican II. But you start to look at stuff like that, and then you realize historically, wait, there, there was a little bit more intermingling going on than I had realized. What do oh, you absolutely. think about that? That's so what true. are your thoughts? Yeah, what are, uh, your, what are your thoughts about that, that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. I think that people who say that Vatican II was new on this or just ignorant of history. Um, 
you know, the church itself was very, very, very uh, permeable when it came to relations with the separated Eastern churches, very flexible in many ways. Uh, Vatican II just kind of codified that in some ways, um, but there's really nothing that new there as far as practice goes, if you look back through the centuries. Yeah, it's always fascinating to to come across that stuff. What are some of the things in Vatican II that you think that us in the Latin Rite that we tend to miss about it that you think is helpful by way of contribution to Eastern Catholics? Um, can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah. So, I mean, are there any contributions that you think Vatican II made in favor of Eastern Catholicism that you think that us in the Latin Rite, whenever we read Vatican II, we just kind of gloss over it and don't realize the implications behind it? Are there is there anything like that that maybe comes to mind? Well, there's a whole document addressed to Eastern Catholics, um, you know, telling us to restore our tradition, to be faithful examples of Eastern Christianity in union with Rome. Um, I am not sure a lot of Latin Catholics are even aware of that document, other than those who are educated. Um, but that document is really fundamental to us Eastern Catholics. It, it, that also reminds me of, you know, Paul, John Paul II. There was the famous expression that he gives that the church needs to breathe with both lungs. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think of that comment? And was he referring to the Eastern Catholics or the Eastern Orthodox? I think he was referring to the Eastern Christian tradition as a whole. That Catholicism is meant to be both, have a Western component and an Eastern component. And the church needs both to be fully healthy. You know, you can be alive with only one lung, but you're not going to be able to, to function at your, your best capacity. Um, and I, I speak from experience. I have both lungs, but my lungs are compromised by, by severe asthma, sometimes worse than others. But I can function with you know decreased lung capacity but I, I can't run a marathon i can't even run a mile i, I get so out of breath I, I couldn't function um the same is true for catholicism now right now one could argue perhaps that the catholic church has one really strong lung and one lung that's kind of shriveled and weak but still present and that would be the eastern catholic churches uh we represent the eastern catholic the eastern christian tradition within catholicism where it's it's spokespeople as representatives in a sense. Um, but for the church to be at its healthiest, having the whole of Eastern Christianity, or at least the majority of it in communion with Rome, once again, would, I feel, make the Catholic church as a whole, a much healthier uh, body. It could run a mile then without being winded. You know, it could, it could actually run a marathon perhaps um, if it had the fullness. And I really believe strongly that the Catholic Church is at such a disadvantage not having both lungs at full capacity, so to speak. Yeah. Because here's where Vatican II, I think, was a lost opportunity. And maybe this can be corrected. I hope it can. At the Second Vatican Council, the bishops there were impressed because there was a large contingent of Eastern Catholic bishops. Now, again, small compared to all the Latin bishops, but still enough that they were a presence. And during the Second Vatican Council, they'd have different liturgical traditions celebrated all the time. So every so many days, the, the Council Fathers would see a Byzantine liturgy or a Maronite liturgy, or they'd see you know, an Ethiopian liturgy or Chaldean liturgy. And they were just blown away by this. And they, they were just impressed that this is Catholicism. Most of them had never even seen that before. They didn't even know about it. So at the Council, a lot of the reforms that were envisioned they were modeling after what they saw in Eastern Christianity. They, they wanted the liturgical tradition of the Roman church to be reformed, to be more like it was in the past, but also they wanted some things they saw in the East to be there as well. You know, things like an altar that was freestanding so that the deacon could incense around it. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that came out of Vatican II were influenced by Eastern practice, liturgy in the vernacular. vernacular. Yeah, the yeah. vernacular, yeah. That's always been the Eastern tradition. But wasn't it Patriarch Ma Maximus who was yes. talking about, I mean, he was when he gave a speech, um, giving reasons why there should be the vernacular in the liturgy. And it seems like they, they adopted some it, usage of the vernacular due it, to his contribution, not because he, of some liberalism, but no. because of an Eastern Catholic patriarch there. Because of a super traditional Eastern Catholic patriarch. I mean, 
Patriarch Maximus, if you know anything about him, was as traditional as it gets. He was the exact opposite of a rabid leftist fanatic, right? He was, uh, well, he was very balanced, but he was a very traditional. And he had a huge influence at the council, huge, uh, on so many different things. Um, so a lot of the stuff that came out of Vatican II, they were looking at Eastern Christians as the model. And then when it came time to implement it, somehow or the other, a lot of these bishops, uh, at least in parts of the world, forgot that Eastern Christians existed and started looking at Lutherans and used Lutherans as the model for what they did. So what the council envisioned as being modeled after Eastern Christian tradition and practice, when it came to implementing on the ground, they forgot the Eastern Christians and started mimicking Protestants yeah. on so many things liturgically. You know, um, The liturgy envisioned by Vatican II was a lot, it was a restoration of the older Roman rite with a lot of Byzantine elements, you know, influences here and there. But in practice, they ended up just modeling it after, uh, you know, Lutheran communion service in many right. places. Right. And the other thing, and this is such a missed opportunity, is the diaconate. And I feel very passionately about this. You know, Eastern Christianity, we've always had deacons, not just as a transitional thing, but we've always had deacons as a full order in and of itself. And deacons play a, a, a very important role in the lives of our churches. And, you know, deacons are often deacons for life, although many are called to become priests by their bishop, but we don't distinguish between permanent and transitional deacons. A deacon is a deacon. In the Western church for a long time, they only had transitional deacons. Um, you only became a deacon for a year before you became a priest. So the diaconate was lost as a functioning true order in the West for many, many, many centuries. So Vatican II, they wanted to bring back the diaconate as a full order in the Latin church. And that was one of the things that came out of Vatican II. But the problem is when it came time to implement it, they started looking at the Lutherans again. And the Lutherans, they had something they called the diaconate, which was actually uh, social workers, basically. They were, they were religiously appointed social workers. And the whole Lutheran understanding was actually based on a mistranslation. Uh, they mistranslated, they misunderstood the word diakonos um, which in Greek refers to a emissary. I mean, in the original Greek, it referred to a servant who represented a higher authority. So it was somebody who spoke on behalf or acted on behalf of a higher authority. An emissary, ambassador would be a better translation. Um, but in the German church, or the German Lutheran denomination, they had mistranslated it as meaning servant in the sense of somebody who does you know, physical service or somebody who, who cares for those in need. And that became the exclusive interpretation of a deacon for the most part in the Lutheran church. And on the ground, a lot of the Latin bishops modeled their restoration of the diaconate after the Lutheran practice. And they completely ignored what deacons are in the East. And in the process, it kind of warped what the permanent diaconate was meant to be. Now, in some places, they've implemented it beautifully. There are a lot of uh, you know, Latin permanent deacons who do marvelous work. And in many places, their ministry is understood and appreciated. But in a lot of places, deacons are treated as glorified social workers. And their ministry is severely limited and extremely misunderstood. And that breaks my heart. And I'm very, very passionate on that topic. Some are going to say, but you know what? If you look at the book of Acts, the very reason why deacons were created was to serve at these tables where you had these meals going on. So there's this service aspect there. What, what would you say to that? Okay. So first of all, there's a translation issue there as well. So the words used in the Greek refer to ministering at the table. but what does that actually mean? Does that mean serving food at a table? Or does it mean bringing communion and then ministering the gospel to people? Was uh, this part of the agape feasts? Uh, it, it was separate. It was separate. But okay. there are people who, for example, who couldn't come together for a liturgy with the rest of the church community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever liturgy was back then was very primitive, of course, very different, but still they, they couldn't be there. So they needed people to go to them perhaps bring them communion and then minister the gospel to them, you know, be there with them. Um, that's very likely what they meant by serving at the table. Mm -hmm. 
because if you look at these men who are ordained as deacons, the first deacons, right after they're ordained, we don't see them, um, you know, basically hauling food from house to house. What we see them doing is preaching, evangelizing. You know, Stephen, shortly after he's, he's ordained, he gets a reputation as being a stellar preacher. He's such a good preacher, they stone him to death for it. And then Philip, the deacon Philip, he's out going from town to town evangelizing. He converts the Ethiopian eunuch and then goes from village to village leading people to Christ. He's doing a whole lot more than just serving food at a table. You know, it seems like I had read a while back, I could be completely mistaken here, but the Church of Rome, really early on, we get this list of how many different people are in this order and that order, and there's this many priests and this many exorcists and this many lectors and seven deacons, to my recollection, seven deacons for the whole city of Rome. Um, why do you think that even early on in the church, we sometimes see a very minimal uh, amount of deacons in light of what you're saying about their importance? Because deacons were actually, again, this varied from place to place. I can't generalize, but in a lot of places, the deacons were such an important order that they kept their numbers small on purpose. Mm. Um, you see, today we tend to look at it like this. You have the bishop, and then the priest you know, is the bishop's representative, and then the deacon is like the priest's little helper. You know, People often think of it that way. But mm. the reality is, in the early church, and really throughout much of Christianity for the first thousand years, the deacon was a representative of the bishop. He wasn't seen as the priest's helper. He was seen as the bishop's eyes and ears. Mm -hmm. And deacons had a lot of power, a lot of influence. Right. We know, for example, that in a lot of places in the early church, again, for the first thousand years in some places, um, the deacons would choose who became priests. The deacons were the ones who would pick the men who would become priests and they'd make the recommendation to the bishop and the bishop would, would make the decision. Uh, but the deacons had so much influence and so much power in some places that kept their numbers small on purpose. Um, because again, they were servants in the sense that they were the, the bishop's trusted eyes and ears. They were the bishop's right-hand man who spoke and acted in, in the authority of the bishop. Uh, that's what they meant by servant. Uh, so they didn't want too many of them because their influence was too strong. And that sadly is why the diaconate ended up being snuffed out in the West. Uh, it largely vanished in the West because in some places deacons had become too powerful and they wanted to rein them in and a lot of places decided to just kind of scale them back all together and turn them into a stepping stone to the priesthood uh, because deacons were actually abusing their authority and going too far. Yeah, there were actual canons who had to that had to be issued saying, okay, the priest receives communion first, then the deacon, because in some cases it was deacons receiving first. Yeah. And I recall there's there's cases where a pope sends as a, his legate or something somebody who's a deacon, and and so you see an important there you can even oh, look you, at the cat that go ahead if you look at at the history of the church a lot of the ecumenical councils had deacons there as the pope's representatives uh you know th that Not was only very that but if you look at the acts of the councils it'll say deacon so-and-so read out this decree you know so you would have yeah. as the main guy who's reading out a decree to the entire ecumenical council would be this deacon Yes. It's, when, uh, it's interesting to see that. When St. Athanasius, when he presided over the Council of Nicaea, he presided over it as a deacon. Yeah, it, I um, I just recall time after time, it, you know, you can look at the Fifth Council, the Seventh Council, Deacon so-and-so said, he's this, de this deacon yep. said this, this deacon said and, that, this deacon and the, read this out. And the Pope would send his representatives to, to various patriarchs throughout the world. And usually, more often than not, those, those representatives were deacons. So for centuries, you know, before the schism happened in Constantinople, the Pope had his official representatives there, and they were almost always deacons. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and go to chat questions. If y'all want to send some to us, make sure to send it to at Reason in Theology. If you can try to stick to the topic of 
Eastern uh, Catholicism and its perspective on Vatican II, that would be excellent. But, uh, you know, if it's absolutely necessary, I might take it, even if it's not. <laughs> One more word on deacons here. One yeah. more word on deacons. Again, the tragedy is uh, when Vatican II was implemented in a lot of places, they didn't look towards the East. They looked towards the Lutheran model. And again, I'm not advocating deacons being given positions of glory. I have no interest in glory or honor. Right. Um, but what I'm saying is the deacons are meant to do a whole lot more than what they're often limited to in some places. Sure. So, you know, they're I know a lot of supposed to have more of a prevalent role in the liturgy. And you see that in the East, the deacon mm -hmm. plays a very prominent role in the liturgy. Whereas in the Latin, right, the deacon is not even there in many of our liturgies. And if he is, he plays a very more a much more of a minor role I should say. yes although liturgically the, the deacon never had as large of a role in the in the roman rite as he did in the byzantine rite the byzantine rite always had a much more prominent role for deacons um, always um but you know a lot of places i know they won't they won't allow deacons to preach i know a lot of yeah. roman catholic dioceses where deacons are forbidden from preaching i know of a lot of roman catholic dioceses where they don't even want deacons where the bishop won't even ordain any any permanent deacons and you know another thing that really bugs me as a lot of Roman Catholic dioceses, not many, but a lot, will forbid deacons from dressing as clergy. And that always struck me as bizarre. You have clergy, you forbid from dressing as clergy. <laughs> and that just, again, it just makes no sense whatsoever. And they argue, well, this way the deacon can be among the people and, and minister to people more effectively. <laughs> well, how do you minister to the people if they don't know your clergy? Um, you know, I know that I go places wearing my clerical attire and people come up to me and ask me to pray for them. People come up to me and talk about things. You know, one day I went to a, a restaurant inside in the bar area with my pastor and we were there wearing our clerical attire and we had three different people come up to us and ask us about faith and ask about prayer. And we could really make a difference because we were in clerical attire. But a lot of places say the deacons, they only minister effectively if they're disguised as lay people. And again, that's very, very, very strange and, and really sad. It's a real missed opportunity. Yeah, I can only speculate as to why anybody would have uh, that that impression. <laughs> wow, that's that's a new one for you. I've, I've, I've heard the argument that they should wear uh, clerical attire because you don't want them being confused with the priest. I've heard that before. <sighs> But that one's new to me. <laughs> but you know that that argument makes no sense either. About being confused with priests, because I know of a lot of Roman Catholic dioceses, this is standard procedure. They may forbid the deacons from dressing as clergy, so they won't be confused as priests. But meanwhile, they have seminarians who are still lay people who have not been ordained to anything, and they require them to wear clerical attire. So in some Latin dioceses, you have seminarians who have not been ordained, dressed as clergy but you have deacons who really are clergy forced to dress as lay people. So again, if they're worried about people being confused with priests, that makes no sense. The, there is a question here from Victoria. <laughs> it's I don't see exactly how it's related, but I, I did think that it was still a good question. How does the guest understand Ephesians 4, 5 through 6, one Lord, one faith, one baptism? I believe Victoria is the Eastern Orthodox, I believe. Okay, so what I would say to that is we have the tragic situation of visible disunity between the Catholic and Orthodox. We are visibly not united. But I think if you go to a deeper spiritual level, we're way more united than most of us realize because we're receiving the same sacraments. We're receiving the same Eucharist. We're receiving the same baptism, and we have, for the most part, essentially the same faith. Again, we have visible disunity, um, but on a spiritual level, we are more united than most of us realize. And I think uh, Vatican II realized that, and I think a lot of the popes have realized that, that there's a visible unity that exists, even if, I mean, there's a spiritual unity that exists, even if the visible unity is not there. Uh, in a way between Catholics and Orthodox that sadly does not exist between, you know, Catholics and Protestants or Orthodox and Protestants. Now there is a unity though, in the sense that we all have one baptism. We're all united to the, to the church, you know, mystically through that baptism. But in the case of the Protestants, uh, missing the other sacraments and the significant differences in faith, I think create more of a real gap. Whereas with the Orthodox, 
apart from the thorny things we discussed earlier, um, the differences are, are minuscule. And I think we are very much united, so much so that they can receive communion in our churches in many cases. This one is from Seraph Song. It's a two-part question. Uh, how do deaconesses factor into that historical role of deacons, similar or more strict? And the second part is um, asking, especially in light of the Orthodox Patriarch of Alexandria ordaining deaconesses. I know Father Deacon Dragani is Eastern Catholic, but still interested if he knows. Right. So <clears throat> deaconesses were historical reality in the Catholic Church, and they do exist in some of the Eastern Orthodox churches today in a very limited capacity. Um, there's no denying the deaconesses were a part of history and they still are a part of the tradition. The question is, what exactly is a deaconess and what does a deaconess do? Um, so deaconesses were important early on because baptism was usually done by full immersion in the nude. And you needed women who could help other women be baptized without compromising modesty. And that was one of, one of the main things the deaconesses did, but they also engaged in other types of ministry as well. Uh, and they played an important role in many places. But the question is, were they really the same as deacons? Um, I would argue that they were different orders. They were different orders. They had different purposes. Now, some people in the Eastern tradition will say, oh, they're they exactly the same as, as deacons because the rite of ordination was very similar. That's true. There was a very similar rite of ordination. But if you looked at what they did after they were ordained, their function was very, very different. They never had a liturgical role in the East. They didn't. Um, now, today, the Armenian Apostolic Church, they have deaconesses playing a huge liturgical role, reading gospels and stuff. That's a later innovation. But historically, um, deaconesses didn't have a liturgical role. They, they had a different ministry altogether, um, an important ministry, but a different ministry. So I think it's important to remember that. Um, sadly, I know that a lot of the people today who are pushing for a restoration of deaconesses, primarily in the West, they're not envisioning deaconesses being restored as they existed in the tradition. I, I think they're envisioning them functioning and doing everything a deacon does, a male deacon does. And I think they're looking at that as a possible stepping stone to the priesthood. They see it as a way of, of breaking down a barrier towards a larger agenda. Um, I'm all for deaconess is being restored, but only in a way that's respectful of the tradition and in continuity with the tradition. And right now, I'm not sure it's even possible to do that. The way the climate is right now, I think if deaconesses were restored, even if the church tried to limit them to the traditional role of a deaconess, you, you know and I know they'd be up there reading the gospel, giving homilies, distributing communion, and doing everything a deacon does. And before you know it, they'd be people clamoring for the de deaconesses now would be clamoring for female priests as the next step. Um, now, regarding the Patriarch of Alexandria, he did ordain a, a number of deaconesses several years ago. But again, if you look at their ministry, they're doing what deaconesses traditionally did. They're not performing the role of a male deacon. There's one here from Peter Wolf. What can Latin write Catholics do to support Eastern Catholics? I think the most important thing that Latin Catholics can do to support us in the East, and by the way, thank you for the question. We, we welcome all support, is educate your fellow Latin Catholics about Eastern Christianity. There's so much ignorance there. And for us, that's a burden that we bear. I mean, how often do I have to explain that I'm a Catholic to people, uh, priests even, and, you know, sisters? I have to tell them I'm Catholic and explain what it means. And it gets a little tiresome. Um, whenever I run, I run across a Latin Catholic who knows what an Eastern Catholic is and understands that we're in union, that's awesome. And I think it's hard for us always having to explain ourselves when we're part of the same family and we should know and understand each other and respect each other. So if you're Latin Catholic, you want to support us, um, take the kids in your parish to visit an Eastern Catholic liturgy if there's one nearby, or show them a video about us, 
or you know direct them to some information about us but just let people know that we exist and you know in your ccd classes and your rcia tell them about us explain that catholicism is universal and it's not just latin but it encompasses a whole lot more because so many people are roman catholic and don't realize the whole of what catholicism is they only understand catholicism in one sliver they don't see the big picture and really they should know the big picture because they should know the church they belong to this one is from lorelei um if eastern catholic churches are in communion with rome but yet separate what differences are allowed while still remaining in communion is it just liturgical or also doctrinal okay so we're we're in communion with rome we're not separate in the sense of being separated but we are distinct um you know we're all churches that are distinct the Roman, the Latin church is distinct from the Ukrainian church, is distinct from the Malachi church, and on and on and on. Um, it's not so much about differences that are allowed. We need to stop looking at it in that paradigm of what's allowed and what isn't allowed, but rather differences that together enrich the church. Um, as far as doctrine goes, we have our own approach to it. We have our own theological tradition. We have our own you know, church fathers. We have our own theologians. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, we respect and we appreciate the theology of the Latin church. You know, the Latin church has its own theological tradition that is beautiful and wonderful. Um, now, if something has been declared a dogma by the Catholic church, even after the schism, we embrace it as dogma, even though it may not reflect our own theological perspective. But at the same time, we realize that it, our viewpoints complement each other. A good example of this would be something like, say, the Assumption of Mary, right? That was declared a dogma by the Catholic Church not that long ago in the grand scheme of things, um, but it's something we in the East have always believed. We just understood it a bit differently. Um, but the way the West defined it is completely compatible with what we believe in the East. Um, so we still approach it from our own perspective. Like, for example, we emphasize in the East that Mary did die before her body was taken to heaven and reunited with her soul. Um, the West tends to be more vague on that question. Um, but again, we embrace it. It's a teaching of the church. And I think every Catholic dogma can easily be reconciled with the Eastern theological tradition. Easily. I think the people who insist that they cannot want to keep it divided. They want to keep the differences magnified. Um, I believe very strongly that Eastern theology and Western theology can be very reconciled. Um, but you have to want to reconcile them. You have to want to look for what we have in common as opposed to highlighting and blowing up the differences. But again, as an Eastern Catholic, we do things our own way. We have our own theology, but we also accept that the theology of the Latin church is just as legitimate and is an equally valid way of looking at things. This one is from Kimberly Hall. Are there any good, simple books explaining Vatican II? Yes. Um, I, I don't know if it's still in print or not, but the one that Dr. Alan Shrek wrote is fantastic. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. If you look up Vatican II, Dr. Alan Shrek, it should come up. Um, but his book on it is so, so good. He really breaks down the council. He breaks down the documents. And he really helps you to understand the vision. If you can find it anywhere, I highly recommend it. It's, it's awesome. There was one more that I saw in here about Eastern Catholic resources. Let me find it again. What resources do you recommend for a Latin who wants to learn more about Eastern Catholicism? Is there an equivalent to the daily Roman Missal Eastern Catholics use? Um, th there is no equivalent to a daily Roman Missal for us. Um, the closest thing you'd find is there's an app you can get it's from Eastern Christian Publications, EC Pubs, um, E C P U B S. If you do a search on the Android store or the um, the uh, Apple store, you'll find it. And it's an app that has our daily divine office. You can use that to prayer divine office on a daily basis. It's a really good app. It's made by Jack Fiegel. He does a fantastic job with it. Um, but we really have no daily missile. Uh, but if you're looking for resources to learn more about us, uh, you can check out my website. I have a website called From East to West. It's East 
the number two west.org. I have a, a lot of stuff on there. I have an FAQ where I answer questions about it. There are also some really good books on the subject. Uh, my good friend, uh, Father Daniel Dozer, wrote a book. It was published recently by uh, Catholic Answers, uh, Questions and Answers on the Eastern Catholic Churches. Yeah. It's, it's a small book, but it's fantastic. He really lays out the basics in a way that's very easy to understand, very well done. Um, check that out as well. I can't say enough good about that. Yeah, I, I saw that. I, I haven't had the chance to read it, but I've definitely been wanting to. Um, Father Daniel's awesome, by the way. He's he's an incredible guy. Yeah, I keep seeing his name uh, coming up. Was was he ordained to the priesthood? Yes, uh, uh, last year. Yeah. Uh, he was a deacon. Yeah, yeah. He was a deacon for a long a long time, uh, and he never intended to become a priest. He was happy serving as a deacon for life, and then one day his bishop called him up and asked him to consider the priesthood. And he already had the education completed, um, so he, he became a priest because the, the bishop asked him to, and he's serving now as a priest. But he's a great example of what an Eastern deacon is supposed to be when he was a deacon, and now he's a great example of an Eastern priest. And he's a, a truly holy man. Yeah, I need to see if I can get him on the show. I think that would be fun. He'd be a great guest. Well, Father Deacon, I really appreciate you coming back on the show. Like I say, you're welcome on any time, any topic, whatever you want to do. I'd love to have you back on. Uh, it's always a pleasure having you. Count me in. I'll be back. I love being here. <laughs> well, you're you're always welcome. And I, I think it's important for us to hear more from our Eastern Catholic brethren. So uh, definitely more to come. We'll discuss more off the air. Everybody, I appreciate, appreciate y'all watching there. Thank you for your participation and your interaction. And by the way, Father, before I, I, I end the stream, is there any um, any plug that you want to put in either for your material or in, anything else? Um, just check out my website, uh, East the number two west.org from east to west. Uh, you might find it helpful and share it with people. Excellent. Once again, thank you for coming on, Father Deacon. And everybody, thank y'all for watching, for your participation, for your questions there in the chat. If we didn't get to them all, I apologize. Maybe post them in the comment section. And of course, don't forget to like, subscribe, share this on your social media, and also check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support us and also get access to extra content. All right. We'll see y'all tomorrow. Till next time. God bless.